wins. You know, we're a game away from winning the thing. I've been a game away from making the NCAA tournament. And we just couldn't get over the hump. I had a, a WNBA player on our roster during that period of time. And she missed seven game-winning moments, whether it be the last shot or the free throw that would have sealed it. And I did what I learned to do coming up as a coach and probably what you all have learned to do. We repped it more. We scripted it more. We worked on coming out of the timeout, and here's exactly what we run. And in the women's game, you could time out and advance it. This is the side of the court. This is what we're going to run. We already, you already knew who was getting the ball, and we repped her and all of that. And we coached it, and it kept failing. And to be honest with you, I had no answer. I didn't know what else to do. It was kind of like we had gotten this far, and, and I just wasn't a good enough coach to get them any to get them to the next step. But I knew there was a next step. So I want to challenge you guys in your thinking, especially, you know, the coaches on here who are winning at an elite level and you keep getting right there, but not to this next step to open up into some of this training. The second challenge I want to give you tonight is get outside the basketball offices and go talk to other sports within your athletic department. Because where I learned this was actually from a Division I lacrosse coach. She's won eight conference championships. You know, she's beaten all the power fives. And she starts talking to me about EQ. Well, I'll be honest with you. I'm like, I don't want to hear about this foo-foo stuff. The kid I coach is not the kid you coach. And I don't want any part of this. So she kept talking to me about it. And then she would recommend a book. And, and she would say something else. And I would be like, it's so girly. I mean, you know, we're not going to do breath work. Are you kidding me? We're just going to run another sprint um, or we're, we're just going to work harder because truth be told, coach, that's all I had ever learned to do within coaching is if it wasn't working, you just keep working hard at it. So I learned what emotional intelligence was and just about out of desperation where I said, well, damn, nothing else is working, so I might as well try this, right? That's kind of where I was with it. So I learned in that process about what's occurring within our brains. And, the, and so when it became a little bit more scientific and a little bit more, wow, okay, I started to buy in. And so every off season, typically in August, I take a topic and a period of time and my entire focus during that is become an expert in that area. So in this specific off season, it's been about five years ago, I decided I was gonna learn about emotional intelligence. And so I got every book that I could find and I started Googling and reading and watching videos and calling experts in the area. And as this started happening with, for me specifically, I started practicing some of this work. The long and the short of it is, I totally got bought in. So I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version of what is emotional intelligence specifically to a basketball coach and how you can implement this into your team. A, you don't need a sports psychologist. B, you don't need a certification. What you've got to do, coach, is commit to doing some of these things within your own life. Because I promise you that you have to do it first to be bought in to coach the athletes to do it. And we are notorious as coaches for after the game saying, all right, y'all, you gotta get great rest. You gotta drink a bunch of water. You make sure you eat a healthy meal tonight because we have to have a big practice tomorrow. And what do we do as coaches? We stay up all night. We watch the film a hundred times while we're drinking a beer. We do all of the wrong things. So I'm gonna coach you a little bit and how you coach can be an elite performer. And the definition I give for being an elite performer, an elite performer leaves nothing to chance ever. And part of this EQ work is you leaving nothing to chance. Okay, the first thing is, let me define EQ. Because the majority of us, like myself, I had no idea what that was. In corporate America, it's an overused term. In basketball coaching, it's undefined. So here's my simple definition for EQ. Emotional intelligence is the ability for me to recognize my own emotions. Then my ability to recognize the emotions in other people. And then the third layer of it, 
the emotions of the environment in which I'm in. So emotional intelligence is the ability for me to recognize my own emotions, the emotions in others, and the environment in which we are in. Okay, so emotions become a complicated thing because something happens to us as adults and we say, oh man, I'm really, I was mad about that. Well, when you really dive a little deeper, what we're describing as what we are mad about, sometimes it's we're just really embarrassed about. So the first thing in EQ is you've got to give emotion a language. So in my training, when I was certified, Dr. Izzy Justice certified me and he taught me uh, about an emotional temperature. And then he taught me how to communicate my language based upon colors. So the first thing I want to do is I want to show you my trusted stick. This is my EQ. This is my temperature stick. And if I am angry, mad, embarrassed, I would just simply say I'm in the red. That's pretty simple, right? So I don't have to really get really deep into exactly what I'm frustrated about. Very simply put, my staff knows I'm frustrated or the team knows you're frustrated or you go home and your family knows you're frustrated. Now, you're in the zone, you're happy, you're feeling good, you are green. And then you've got what is gold, which is, that's how you should feel the majority of the time. Only when you're in high performing situations would you wanna be in the green. When you are in a time that you need to be an elite performer, like coach calling a timeout, you can never be in the red. All right, let me simplify it for a basketball coach. If you shoot the ball 0 of 5, that's being in the red. If you shoot it five of five, you're green. If you shoot it three of five, that's what you should shoot or you shouldn't be taking that game, shot in the game in my opinion. So let's go through it. If you are in the red, here's your number one rule. When you are in the red, you can make no decisions. Never make a decision when you are in the red. Okay, coach, your team uh, turned the ball over three times. The other team just goes on a 10-0 run, and you call a timeout. Your team runs over to the bench, probably in the red. And if, the, if you can't think of anything besides, you know, maybe a choice word or two, or that you want to snatch up one of those kids, you are definitely in the red. Let's talk about physical symptoms of being in the red. Now, remember, you're talking to someone for probably – uh, at least 12 to 15 years of my head coaching career, I coached in the red probably every single game. If you saw a picture of me on our website, my eyes, my pupils are dilated, right? Think about the pictures of you, coach. Are you sweating? Do you have a vein in your neck? Are your pupils dilated? Is your heart rate uh, rapid? Those are all physical signs of emotionally being in the red. So think about within your coaching, how many times are you in the red and your brain can't really think of what to say? So let's say you and your wife or, or you and your um, husband, you're in an argument and you can't think of anything but screw you. Then you're probably, and that was a nice way to put it. So you are probably at what point, you're in the red at that point for sure. Because when your amygdala is closed, I'm going to geek out a little bit here and talk a little bit about your brain. When you become in the red, you have amygdalas on both sides. And those amygdalas shut. And with those amygdalas shut, you become in the red. Now, the amygdalas are what keeps you alive. So if you're walking down the street, a car runs off on the sidewalk, and you quickly jump out of the way, your amygdala is closed, and you just react. It. The same as if you touch a hot stove and move your hand right away, your brain didn't go through the proper cognitive processes to say, move out of the way or move your hand. Your amygdala is closed and it saved your life. So in those situations, it's really important. In high performing situations, it's very important to keep a clear head. We want to be in the green, especially in timeouts. If you guys have ever coached a team in a timeout, a full timeout, and the five kids are sitting in front of you, and one of the knees are bumping up and down, jumping up and down. You need to take them out of the game right now because they're not hitting a game-winning shot. They're probably going to miss the box out because they are in a red and having physical symptoms. Now, let's talk about the physical symptoms. These physical symptoms last for four hours. So let me prove it to you. You get up and your car won't start. 
You get up and you have a flat tire. You are pissed off. And then you are irritated. It's ruined your morning. You've probably said those things. However, by lunchtime, you start to feel a little bit better. That helps explain to you that it is a four hour period of time for those physical symptoms to change. Well, most basketball games are two hours. So you don't have two hours to sort through these things. So I'm going to give you just a couple of techniques. This is a, there's a lot of content to go into it, but as a basketball coach, I'll just specifically share some things that have worked well with me. Again, going back to the temperature stick, you want to be green and as high green as you can be going into competition or going into practice or going into a really, really important meeting with your athletic director. How do you get to be a high green? Well, you have to understand the concept of recruiting dopamine to your body. So dopamine is the reason people are so addicted to social media. How many likes did I get? How many retweets did I get? It is incredibly important for you to practice the five senses to recruit dopamine. So what does that mean? Uh, I create a green playlist. I'm creating a green album. I'm using my five senses, my ears, what I'm seeing, I'm controlling the environment. Surfing social media does not allow you to get green. Your brain really does not like this upward movement because it's unpredictable. You're unsure of what is next. And all of a sudden you could see, you know, a kid post something really stupid on there or an ex has got a new boyfriend. And all of a sudden you're into the red and you're an hour from practice. You're probably not gonna have a great practice. So I would challenge you, A, to give your brain a break from social media and instead create an album. And an album would be your most favorite moments, best vacation you ever went on. Maybe it's pictures of your kids because your brain really likes East to West. Never shuffle it. Keep it in the exact same order. The exact same thing when you're picking the songs that you listen to. So let me give you an example. So when I first did these exercises, and I was asked, what's your favorite music? I said, well, I like John Mayer or I like Jack Johnson. And so that's what I created as my green playlist. So when I put that type of music on and I started listening to it and getting ready to go into practice, getting ready to go into a game, I was like, wow, you know, this just, I don't even think this stuff is working. I had to get to know myself. And the way that I got to know myself is I learned, you know what I like? I like old school hip hop and R&B. That's what I like to listen to. So that's on my green playlist. I like Jack Johnson and I like John Mayer, but mostly when I'm on the pontoon boat drinking some wine. So you've got to know what you like in high performing situations. Coach, when you learn yourself, you'll be able to coach your team much, much better. If you're having a rough day, typically practice doesn't improve. So you've got to make sure that you're green before you can teach your athletes to become green. The other thing that I'd like to, to share with you relative to practice that you can take EQ and put it in right away with your team is a debriefing exercise. We never leave practice without the debrief. And it takes roughly 10 minutes. It's a, one of the best things that we do. It enables me to reinforce the EQ training. I call it living green. It allows me to reinforce the living green every single day, but also get a temperature of where the team is in that specific moment. So in the debriefing exercise, it's very simple. I ask them, what do we need to work on? And now what do you need to work on has to be something that goes onto the practice plan the next day. So what we need to work on can't be your attitude. What we need to work on has to be on ball defense. What has to be rebounding or boxing out. Very, very specific. It's an interesting exercise because sometimes when the kids figure out what they need to be working on, they all of a sudden get much better at it much, much more quickly. Mm -hmm. The second thing I ask them, I say, well, what went well today? And a lot of times they have to search. You know, remember, we're doing this at the very end. Things that they did well may have been at the very, very beginning. And it becomes an exercise in them finding positives because kids right away are going to gravitate to the negative. So a lot of coaches and a lot of uh, coaches clinics that you'll go to or you'll read books and they'll talk about positive to negative ratio. And it'll be eight to one, nine to one, 10 to one, 12 to one, a hundred different ones. I believe that positive to negative is 1000 to one differentiation because cortisol is that much more powerful than dopamine. 
So when you decide that you're going to get really critical and really get after them, you need to be prepared of how that is going to hit and how much you're going to have to do to repair. There's times, there's places, and there's ways to coach to where you can allow your team to make sure that they are performing at a high rate when it's time to. That doesn't mean that you're not intense. That doesn't mean that you don't coach them hard. Because I coach hard, and I'm pretty intense, and I'm pretty direct, but I have learned how to add physical touch. I have learned to add encouragement in between when I'm having to tell them the truth, and sometimes that's the hard truth. So the debrief, you get them to say what, what do they need to work on, what went well, and the third piece is to that is what didn't go well. And that's when they're going to talk about their attitude or their effort or maybe that they just weren't a very good teammate that day. Then the third piece is we ask them, tell me about your red, yellow, green moment. And this is more about a recognition. And they may say things like, well, coach, when you, when you fussed at me for missing those two free throws, right away I was in the red, but my teammate said these trigger words or my teammate gave me a high five. And that allowed me to not really be in the red, but feel like I was leaning in that direction relative to my temperature. And the final piece is we ask them about their mental skill. And when you ask them about the mental skill, what that brings up is, hey, you know, I failed a test and I was walking to the gym and I was, I, I tell them not to take one problem into two problems. So one problem is you fail a test. Two problems is you fail a test and then have a bad practice. So the ability to be able to leave the class and come into the classroom, this EQ training, they put their earbuds in, they're on the way walking, they're participating in their exercises to get ready to have a good practice. And they will tell these stories as to what they are doing leading up into competition, which has been just so incredible for our team. So um, the final piece, Coach, and it's more about you um, and your structure is I'm just going to challenge you to think about it differently. You, you don't have to grind. You know, that's the term everybody's using all the time. You know, actually, we're coaching basketball. I'm not sure that we're grinding. Grinding means to me that you're taking a rock and you're carrying up a mountain. And you're sitting it up there and you're taking a rock and you're carrying it back down. That's grinding. We're impacting and influencing young people and helping them. So I believe what we need to do is inspire mm -hmm. and we need to take care of ourselves because we're not going to be very um, our longevity in this industry isn't going to be very good. I had a period of time where my stress level was out the roof. I had gained a ton of weight. I had incredibly bad habits. And I have since developed what I call the three G's. And it's God, it's gratitude, and it's get your day going green. And those three things, if I keep it to the forefront, and I understand that when I wake up and I put two feet on the floor right away, I find something to be grateful for. And some mornings, guys, that's harder than it is other mornings, but figuring out something to be grateful for, making sure that I take time for myself relative to devotionals. I'm a big, big, big uh, podcast person. So I love to feed my brain early with inspiration. And then the get going green is the process of how are you recruiting dopamine before you even start your day? Like I want to have so much dopamine built up that when things come at me during the course of the day, it doesn't absolutely, you know, just kill me and kill my productivity because I couldn't take the adversity. So when you get going green and you've got green stores, I think you're better for your athletes. You're better in your personal life. And in generally speaking, you're going to be a happy coach. And I promise you, when you've got a happy team that's enjoying what they're doing, they'll play longer in the season, you know, the team, you can feel those teams who have been grinding and the teams that have been grinding typically are the ones who are ready to go to spring break. So coach Sutton, I have said a lot, probably 10 minutes longer than you asked me to start. Uh, but I would love to open it up if you would like me to expand on any uh, of the information relative to EQ or how to become an elite performer. Absolutely. But first and foremost, uh, uh, Heather, I learned a long time ago that when the, when the, when the pastor's preaching a good sermon, you just go ahead and let him preach, right? <laughs> so, you know, outstanding. Uh, the text message I've been receiving, everybody's receiving what you're, what you're teaching us tonight. So, you know, we want to open it up to questions now. This has been fantastic and will continue to be fantastic. So, fantastic. So, Coach Curry, if you could ask the first question, please. Um, how do you build emotional intelligence when it comes to culture between teammates 
when um, they're not on the same page. So coach, I think this is actually a connector. And so a year ago, I coached at a junior college and this was, um, you know, a little bit of a testing the waters. Does this stuff really work or not? Okay. So I want to keep in mind, I've, I've put this in at the division one level. I've put it in at the junior college. So I feel like I've seen it at both extremes. So you think junior college and you think emotional outburst, you think someone's going to say something, do something that's going to get them suspended, kicked off the team, whatever. Right. So the first two weeks of our preseason, we never picked up a ball. All we did was this. And, you know, they're like, seriously, like we're not, we're not picking up a ball. We're not running. We're not lifting weights. And I go, no, we're building a foundation. So if we don't have a foundation of habits and practices and connection, it doesn't matter if we're fit. It doesn't matter if we understand our transition offense. So that connected those kids. And so seeing it happen at that level and where once we started running, so we're on the, we're on the soccer field running 300s, there was about nine of them that wanted to quit. And the other nine were saying, you cannot make a decision when you're in the red. Like you can quit tomorrow, but you can't quit now. So it, that has been a really, really cool element of it. And so when I did it at the junior college and I saw those kids moving away from social media after shoot around and telling their families, see, this is, that's a huge piece with, when you're coaching at risk kids. So their families on game day, We'll call them two hours before tip off because they've been a death in the family. And now this kid is, is comes to, to um, pr uh, not practice, but comes to warm ups. You know, they're they're upset. And when you bring that into the locker room, it's infectious. And so we put parameters around those kinds of things. So I'll give you a great example of that. So I don't have my phone after shoot around. I have one assistant coach that has their phone on. The players know after shoot around, phone, make your last calls, phone goes to airplane mode. Someone's giving you, you know, good luck, handle that call, get off of it, no social media. If there is an emergency, here's who you contact in our organization and we'll make sure this information gets disseminated. So that that kid, sometimes it's a family member that creates a mishap in their preparation. Sometimes it's the boo thing, but regardless, we're able to, to kind of keep some separation between both of those. So I, I have said more than one time, you get 30 opportunities to do this. How can you have a funky warm up? Because the kids, you can tell during the warm up session, like, uh oh, something's up, something's off. You work 365 days for 30 opportunities. And in COVID, it's less than 30 opportunities. Why in the world wouldn't you want to be at your best on game day? So this is how we put per no. golf yep. term. And so in golf, it's very important who the caddy is. And a lot of times they don't get a lot of attention and, and they don't get complimented every second. But if that golfer goes up and hits a swing and when it comes back to hand the caddy the club, the caddy goes, Gosh, that's the worst. That's the worst shot I've seen you hit in five years. That golfer is not going to be in a great mental state heading into that next hole. So we want our assistant coaches to be caddy. So don't stand on the baseline and smack your teeth and go, "Gah, they're not into it." And you know, oh man, you got to you got to warm up harder. You're clapping. You're smiling. That's going to produce dopamine. You're high fiving everybody. And you know, my number one thing is. You do not create mishaps for these kids on game days. When it's over, we're going to hold them accountable for doing ridiculousness, but we're not going to do it during those 30 times we work, you work, they work. 365 days for 30 opportunities. We're all going to be at our best in those moments. Next question, JB. Hey, Coach. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, the question I have for you, uh, it's two questions. First one was, you talked about the five senses and you talked about building a playlist and having a photo album. What were the other three senses? Like, how did you build those other three senses? Uh, okay, so the, you know the five senses. Right. 
<laughs> okay. I didn't know how, how far back I had to go there, Justin. So the one that I have told that I think works the best for me is the smell. And you can use that the same as taste. So for me, it's a Tic Tac for you. It may be some gum, um, but it, you know, it helps it. What it's doing is it's resetting or it's helping you prepare for big moments. So I don't use Tic Tacs in any other time of my life besides game days and practices. And so that has become, uh, and I'm always using the, the white that's got a little peppermint in it because that's going to help with, you know, keeping you awake and keeping you engaged. Now I'll give you two, um, two essential oils, peppermint essential oil, put a dab on the bottom of your feet, put a dab behind your ears. If you put a little right here, especially if you've been out late, maybe you've been on a recruiting trip, you drove back late, you've got practice. We've all been there and you are dead going into that practice. Don't grab a Red Bull or all that other crap. Grab a citrus oil, utilize the peppermint so that you can have a great practice. The same, if my day has been filled with meetings or behind the computer right away going into practice, I'm going to add the peppermint. If you'll use the grapefruit essential oil and just put a dab in your water during practice, especially if you have a long practice. So like at the JUCO level, hour and a half we probably went, uh, but I have been known to will go three hours. When we go three hours, my focus is not as good. I don't think anyone's focus is good, but I have learned that the grapefruit enhances focus if you need that for longer durations. Maybe that's just a long film session. Uh, with your staff, but those essential oils are also things that I have done to enhance the five senses. I will also encourage you, give yourself permission to go outside and walk your campus for 10 minutes right before practice or jump on the elliptical for 20 minutes. Energy breeds more energy. Sleeping does not breed more energy. So if you, if, uh, something staying in motion, you've heard that one, right? We've got to stay in motion, especially as a long basketball season happens and fatigue starts hitting us and specifically uh, hitting the coaches who've been in it, you know, for longer. So it, and my recovery takes a little bit more than it used to. For sure. I appreciate that. And the second one was just the going off of coach Curry was, you know, you talked about in the beginning, how you built that emotional foundation. Can you give us a drill or an activity uh, that helped you build that emotional foundation in the beginning with your team? Yeah. One of the very first ones to have them identify uh, what color they are, is do a timeline. And so we'll draw a simple timeline and we'll say, okay, let's do a timeline of yesterday. So what time did you get up? And we'll just kind of chart it like 6 a.m., 7, 8, 9, all the way every hour. And just plot what you were doing and what emotional temperature you were, right? So you got a bad text message, you had the best breakfast you've ever had, you felt a test, whatever, right? And just see if they can do that through the day. Some of it is awareness and understanding. And then we'll build on that exercise and we'll do a, a life timeline. And so we'll do the same. So if, if this is green and this is red and here's your timeline, what's the first thing you remember? So I'm six years old or some, some of the kids are younger. First thing you remember and build it all the way up. And so you'll see things of going, my parents got a divorce or it's the best Christmas I ever had, or I was the first to graduate high school. And so they'll plot their life timeline. Um, and then some of them are willing to share it with the team. I never put them on the spot. Like, you know, I want you to just this exercise to be for you, but if they're willing to share, that's a big time connector when they start sharing the big moments in their lives to understand that you're not defined by them, but let's recognize your emotions within them. And so they're, more easily able to recognize what their emotional temperature is before the emotional temperature becomes the four hours where we get a non-recovery segment. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Uh, next question. The queen, Coach Foy. Hey everybody. Um, uh, Coach Macy, thank you for being here with us and sharing this awesome information. Um, I don't know if you remember me, but uh, you recruited me at East Carolina. I sat at your office um, and talk to you. Um, yeah, remember you said no. Are you regretting that to this day? I re yeah, we, I don't know coach, that's how it went. Forget. We don't forget that stuff. <laughs> I don't know that's Stay how it went. Stay uh, in the green. <laughs> um, well, my question is, so, I mean, 
I say I say that to say like I've watched your career, I watched you know how you coached, came to your campus, stuff like that. So my question is, um, when did you started to incorporate emotional intelligence, um, you know, in your career and the way you coach and lead? And um, if you was to start again using this, where where do you think you would be if you used this from the beginning? Well, first, um, I started later than I wished I would have. So probably. I was certified in 2017, so four years ago, but I finished the certification, but I began this process in 2016, and it took over a year of me just doing it myself, and so I was doing a lot of trial and error in my personal life with my coaching staff and with the team without telling them it was part of emotional intelligence, and to be honest with you, I'm so protective over my team and the group that I wouldn't want to unveil anything that I was 100% sure that this was the secret sauce and this was the advantage. So as I did that myself for a year, you know, I realized that I wasn't the best version of myself. And because I wasn't the best version of myself, I wasn't giving to them to the level that I could give. And so when I became really in tune with me and learned how to live a more healthy life, then I felt more confident. So I took the next step. Then I unveiled it to this coaching staff. And there were a couple on the coaching staff that felt great about it. There were others on the coaching staff like, ah, this is, you know, this is too foo-foo and, and what are we doing? And so then we went to the next step to unveil it to the team. I had a really, really good team psychologist that uh, helped me through the process. And then she and I, so that it didn't come from Coach Macy, right? It didn't because the team's like, man, Coach Macy's bringing more to it. So she unveiled some of it. I introduced, she would, and it would just come from different voices until we had it fully implemented. As I mentioned before, truth be told, the junior college and then this past season here, that's been a more organic way to unveil it because I didn't have a way. And when I was fighting old way, new way, it became so complicated where it was like, gosh, like, why are we switching up everything we've been doing? And the change seemed like it was too much. But now it's all they know. It's all I know. It's all our coaching staff knows. And so I'll tell you, um, I'll give you when I had assistant coach with me seven years at ECU. She played for me, was a video coordinator, worked herself all the way up to assistant coach. And we, she really bought in and loved this stuff. And one of the things that we talk about is how do you prevent a mishap? So it's mishaps and solutions. And so your mishap could be, um, late for practice. Okay. What's the solution? I'm going to set two alarms. I'm going to have a buddy system. I'm going to, you're already preventing becoming in the red because you're talking about what mishaps could occur. Well, we put this in, we really buy into it and we're on the road July recruiting. And I flew back a day or two ahead, finished training. The kids were leaving for summer and all three assistants were on the road. And we have a recruiting meeting that, you know, 11 a.m. They're on the first flight back. You guys have all been there. We wanted to huddle. We're going to get organized. And right away, we're going to call all of our top recruits. Well, they missed the flight. And they missed the flight. They were late to the airport. All three assistants on the same flight missed the flight. The head coach is back home. All of you guys are thinking about this, right? Like, no way. So she calls me. Hey, coach. We had a mishap, and that's exactly how she started it. Right away, that diffused it. I said, so I come back, and I go, what was the solution? And she told me what they'd done and what was in place. I didn't become in the red. They weren't in the red, and we were still able to finish our day really, really productive. And we just called an audible, and we handled some stuff virtually. But I think it also allows uh, tough conversations or conversations the hierarchy and people are going to get upset with it allows you to soften the blow I think when they when there becomes confrontation okay and uh, if, if you would have um, started this at the beginning of your coaching career uh, where do you think you would be I don't know I'm kind of happy where I am right now um, maybe I'd have the opportunity to coach you had I started a long time ago who knows, right? Who knows? I will tell you this, um, you know, what I've won more games. I don't know if that's specifically what you're asking, but probably um, I, I would imagine. Yes. I know for sure 
that there was a period of my time, that period of my life that I was like, I don't know how many more years I can coach. This is year 20. I just finished year 20. And I was like, I don't even know if I can have the longevity. You see some coaches coach for 40 years. And I'm thinking if I got to 20, it would be a success. Had I implemented earlier on, I think I would have at that point known that my longevity in this industry could have lasted through 40 years. Um, But now I've I've said uh, publicly, and I'll say this again, I'm looking forward to the next 20 because I think the next 20 is going to be my best 20. Thank you, coach. It's good to see you. And I love your book. Good to see you too. Thank you. Outstanding. Uh, Next question, David Bentley. Hey, coach Macy. It's good to see you again. Good to see you. Um, My question is, do you have, do you use on the stick, do you use like body language or visual cues in practice games? as to kind of reinforce to your players, as in if you see a player get an and one and they go high five their teammate, that was a green, or you see them hang their head after a turnover, you're in the, you know, don't get in the red. Do you use your cues like that with body language or anything? We have what's called control alt delete, similar to what you would do on a computer. All of a sudden the computer's not working. I'm not a real big computer person. I just control alt delete turn it off to turn it back on and maybe it'll work at that point. So we call them resets. And so the kids have communicated that to me typically. So what is your trigger word? What is your reset? So some of them may miss their first free throw, tap the tattoo on their arm, and that's their signal of their reset. They'll also have phrases like I've got your back. And so we've shared that with one another through the team. And so when something's not going right for them, We pre know it's not going right and we can get right away into what their trigger words are or their control alt delete to help move them through that. Uh, You know, screaming at them, don't get in the red is going to just put them in the red. Okay, so you've got to really communicate and talk through that. But to talk about things like high fives or maybe it's negative things like rolling your eyes or, you know, frustration type body language you see in the game. We call those wrecking balls. And so we'll have like a soft, like a soft, uh, squishy ball in practice. And sometimes I'll have an assistant coach have one and it allows confrontation without confrontation. So David, if, if you rolled your eyes in practice and I saw it because I tell them all the time, I'm not looking away. So I'll take it and I'll toss it to them and they'll know I saw you do it. You didn't kill our program and you didn't smother our culture, but it's like you take a building and you throw that wrecking ball into the building. You crack it. It's not going to fall the first time you throw the wrecking ball at it, but over repetitive and amounts of time, you're going to destroy that building. And so just making them aware that those small things in in weeks and in months to come are going to be huge things that are destroying our program. So we'll talk about building blocks and wrecking balls. And we'll take um, like Legos and we'll put them together and we'll say, hey, you had a building block moment today. Today, when you went and picked your teammate up from whatever, whatever, boom, building block. So we'll talk about it in those ways without creating intense conversations in the middle of practice that take away from everybody else. It takes away from your teaching and it, it draws so much attention to the negative that kids who are searching for attention do more negative things to get more attention. Thank you. Next question, John Sarge Sears. I'll mute you sometime, there you go. Hey bud, what's up man? I haven't seen you forever. We've had a few battles in the Carolina conference days. We Um, did, back in the old days, man. Way, way old. So first I wanna give a shout out to Aisha because she's on her way, all right? She's part way there. You know, learn when emotions are appropriate and use them. Sounds like one of these EQ kind of concepts already. So she's on her way. So I really appreciate that. Let's get back to your book. Like I tell my guys all the time, you know, don't be insulted by the simplicity. Like it's like it's not rocket science, it's basketball, right? The title of your book, Two Feet Forward. Can you explain that to us? Again, I don't I want to hear like we can all assume we know what it is and what it means and where it goes. Where does it come from from you? Okay, so a long time ago, we came up with two feet in. 
and I was working at a place that uh, it's improbable that you win. You know, Coach, you and I both worked at places that it's improbable to win at. And I think, I think all of us have taken jobs that we call them bad jobs, and you turn them into good jobs, and it's improbable to win. So two feet in is about being perfectly imperfect. It's about being committed when they do it wrong, being committed when things don't go right. So that is what two feet in is. And so I think by having that mindset and not having an exit strategy, you can get things accomplished. But if you have one person that's lukewarm or kind of believes in it, you will never win at places that are hard to win. Now, I've worked at multiple places. I've also worked at places where it was really easy to win. And if you didn't win, you were just a sorry coach and you just really weren't working very hard. So I've seen it done both ways where you just can kind of put the roll the balls out and recruiting's kind of easy. And the, the struck, and a lot of times that's the structure of the institution. It's also the history of a place and the culture that was grown well before we got there. So that happened over a course of time. So I think I've got good comparison. So two feet forward is a mindset. So we knew what two feet in is. But two feet forward, I think for me, was about what that next journey was going to be about. So the book started, um, gosh, it was in the works probably five years before it was published. I had worked on it with an ECU professor where I was simply talking and he was taking notes and writing and he would send it to me. And he wrote the first five chapters, emailed it over. And honest to God, I couldn't understand every seventh word. And I thought. I can't put this out. I, I don't even I don't even know what that word means. So I called him up and I said, listen, man, you're way too smart for me. I appreciate you doing this. So I, I talked to another professor who who decided that, that she, she probably could help me a little bit more. And I said, I want to create a, a work that is coaches can read it when they get ready to get on a recruiting trip and an airplane going from New York to Vegas. They can get this thing read and they don't read it. And they think, man, you know, it's a lot. I want them to read a story, understand the story and go, man, that happened to me or, or man, that could happen to me and let me learn from it. So really, really an easy read. But it's, it's very vulnerable for me because it talks about a lot of my failures and a lot of things that I learned as a as a 26 year old head coach. So two feet forward, everyday lessons in leadership. Um, you're definitely not going to get that much smarter from it. But I hope that when you read it, you you hear what my heart is on this coaching journey. I love the fact that you talked about the professor was over the top and you brought it back to simplicity, right? Don't be insulted at how simple things are. And I just ordered it. So it's on its way. I'll Appreciate it, coach. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the Shannon Morris. Yes, sir. Coach Macy, thank you for your time. I wanted to know, um, how has emotional intelligence changed your outlook on life and your coaching career? Well, I just think I'm a, a better version of me. I had somebody tell me the other day, I was interviewing them on a podcast, and they said, you know, a better me is a better we. And I thought, gosh, what a good way to say that, um, because that is what EQ is, the ability to understand your own emotions. And I think that I had so much stress and so much anxiety, and I allowed that to create such agitation. And so I wasn't very patient with people. So you'd have a question, and I'm like rushing you through it, and I'm answering it, and I'm like, you should already know that. And so that had nothing to do with the person that was asking the question. That was more about me, and that was more about I was super stressed out. And so I think as coaches, when we're better able to manage and understand the stressors of the job and when you're going to be a little bit more irritated than others and then be able to, you know, be able to explain it to you, the people you work with every day of going, hey, listen, we're leading up to that championship game. And so I'm going to be feeling a little more edgy than normal and put parameters, put these mishaps, put these solutions in play. And then I'm going to go ahead and tell you, if you're already feeling a high level of stress and you aren't doing things to fill back up your tank, it is going to be a recipe for disaster. And it's, as I said earlier, don't recruit your own problems. And by having super, super high levels of anxiety and stress 
and then not being able to manage them and then saying things you really have no business saying is creating more problems, Coach, for you and your program. Thank you so much, Coach. Uh, next question, JT, John Thompson. Coach, how you doing tonight? Hey, bud. Uh, my question is about your debrief at the end of practice. Uh, how long do you spend with that? And I mean, if you went around the entire team and asked everyone, you know, what they did well, what they didn't, how they could get better tomorrow, whatever, that might take a while. So I'm just curious as to, you know, how you, is that a, a group response? One or two quick things, how does that work? Coach, congratulations on a great season, by the way. Thanks. Um, absolutely. So we bring out a dry race board to every practice. So I, I first, I have my typical practice plan for myself and our staff. And it's as detailed as you can possibly imagine. I post it in the locker room. So the kids are aware of, of what we're going to do. But I take the dry erase board and I simply write objectives. And I typically do two. And so it may be today, the objective is we're going to get better on ball accountability. And number two, we're going to get better, you know, in rebounding, boxing out. And the kids understand that they don't need to know every drill we're going to do or every, every single series we're working on. But they understand that when we get better at these two things, practice is over. And they understand that language very, very clearly. And underneath those two objectives, I draw a basketball goal and a rim. And I write each of those things, work on what didn't go well on there. And when we come over, as our debrief takes less than 10 minutes, I give one of the kids the dry erase board. And it's literally rapid fire. I go, okay, guys, work on. Okay. And, and you know, they'll, they'll list four things, pop, 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 pop. And she'll jot it on there really, really quickly. And then we'll do the same for every one of those. So, so it's definitely not a long drawn out deal. Um, and it's definitely where I let them lead and I let them talk through it, but no one is, remember they're exhausted. We just finished practice. They're out of breath and I don't like them to get stiff and get, you know, you know how that all works. Right. So, We've been in it long enough that we don't want that to happen. But at the same time, when they think it's their ideas, it goes a long, long, long way. I, and I'll bring this up too. Only because we've been doing the debrief so long, this year we started the season one and seven. And so after every single loss, I wanted to kill them. And so instead of killing them, I debriefed at the end of games. And so instead of me getting up there and ranting and raving and this and that and this and that, we literally debrief. And they basically will say all the things that you want to say to them. Oh, man, we didn't play with heart. We didn't, you know, and I'm like, well, if they can acknowledge it, then hopefully, you know, we're able to correct it more quickly. And we did finish the season five and two. So we did continue to get better, I think. And I think these type things you put in, you have to be consistent. So you can't debrief when it, after a good practice. You have to debrief after every single practice and make sure there is no deviation from that plan. Great. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Uh, next, next question, Griff. Hey, Coach Macy. I'm actually a, currently a graduate assistant at East Carolina University. And uh, my question is, how do you get buy-in from from the players in terms of emotional intelligence, especially at the JUCO and you saying how you sort of started like practices. When was there sort of a point when players sort of accepted it? You know, at the beginning, just like with everything you do, you got to be a salesman on it. Um, and I'll come in and I have a PowerPoint presentation where I go through all of the details much more slowly than what we have tonight and really show them pictures of their brain and show them what's happening, which helps. And then I think you get what you emphasize and they understand that we're not going away from it. I also tell them the story of how I've learned about it, how I've implemented with teams, how we've been successful doing it this way. You know, they buy into the green, they'll, they'll go by me and say, hey coach, I'm green. And so it's awesome. I mean, it's a really, it's cool to buy into all those kinds of things. And I'll send them little emojis with the green check mark on it. Uh, if they've got a big test and things that day. So you're definitely selling it just like you would with anything else. 
And I think, Coach, that's why you need to do it for a year yourself because you've got to buy in to such an extent and be the expert in that area, just like you would be the expert in any defense or offense that you're planning to run. You can't know just a little bit about it and then think you're going to have everyone buy in. But when they feel better and they see the results of it, uh, they'll, they'll buy in really, really quick. I'm telling you, this is incredible stuff when they realize, holy cow, I don't have bad warmups anymore. Or every single time I come to practice, I emotionally feel energized to compete. Griff, one thing that we, we all know um, is before you can have buy-in, you have to have believe-in. So when that believe-in, like Coach Macy says, starts with you um, and then you doing the, the work and to get them to start to, to believe in you uh, because you've done the background and done the work, then they'll start to buy into what you have that you were offering to, 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 to improve and make them better. And so believe in starts with you and then it leads into to buy in. Next question, Daryl Bruce, Squirrel. Thank you, sir. Uh, coach, just uh, wanted to ask, uh, pick your brain a little bit. Uh, can you pinpoint exactly when did you start to kind of notice or see uh, the evolution of the need uh, for more of an in-depth emotional connection and uh, and what was the first step you took in that process? Honestly, Daryl, it was more about we were successful. I didn't stumble upon this when we were losing. I stumbled upon this when we were successful, but kept only getting to this level and we couldn't really get over the hump. And so, you know, it's interesting. I, I think when you stumble upon things, sometimes it's either when you are at the depths of despair or you're this far from being elite. And when I found this stuff, we were this far from being elite. And so, and then <laughs> I was at the depths of despair. So I've been able to incorporate it kind of in, in both rounds. But in all honesty, the more I would read about it uh, and the more I would talk to folks about it. And you, if you really want to know about it, go into corporate America. Let them talk to you about utilizing soft skills and utilizing EQ, because this is something that they're talking about, you know, and, and they're working on million dollar deals, right? And so you can't have a bad day when you're closing the deal. And the worst is, I mean, I can remember being a division one coach and having a bad day and we've got our top recruit on campus. You can't have a, you can't have a bad meeting with your AD when your top recruits on campus and expect a closer. I mean, it's just, it's not working. So, I would just tell you, if this is something you really want to do, you know, I'm, I, call me. We can talk through it and go through it. But this is stuff that in my mind that, A, I think I'm a better coach, but I think I'm also a better human. And I think kids who, are, who have so much distracting them and so many things that, that are in front of them that would push them in the wrong direction, these are things that also level them out and have them as anchors. I'll tell you, Coach, you, you're right that, uh, you know, observing uh, people in other walks of life and, uh, and Kevin Sutton, we've known each other for about 30 years and I've, I've gone to football practices. I, I, I've gone and, and met with CEOs and sat in on business meetings because all, all of that stuff was relevant in terms of how you're trying to reach uh, people and especially young people. So. Yes, sir. Thank you. Coach Macy, uh, before we ask uh, the next question, can you talk uh, and tell us what soft skills are and why they're, they're important for us to know? Yeah, it's so funny. I was doing some uh, role playing with a coach getting ready to go on an interview over the weekend. And um, he said, I'm going to get up. I'm going to sit really up, up on the table. And I'm going to put my hands on the table and I'm going to be, you know, and I said, or you could utilize some soft skills and make connections with people and smile a little bit. And he's like, well, what? Soft skills. And I go, yeah, that, that goes a long way because it diffuses people. Whether it's a recruit and their family on campus, you know, most families only go through this thing one time. They're nervous. That's natural. You go on a job interview, typically you're nervous. I guarantee there's people on the committee who are nervous because their institution put them on a committee that they didn't really want to be on and they know nothing about athletics. So utilizing those soft skills disarms folks and gets them where they're comfortable and trust you 
uh, which is a huge part of EQ of understanding the emotions in others. Where that doesn't always have to be your team or your staff. Sometimes that's your athletic department or your athletic director and your ability to manage up or utilize some soft skills can go a long way at your current institution. All right, uh, next question, Trey Vermel. Thanks coach. So uh, coach Macy, I loved uh, your whole presentation. Um, I want to ask you two part question. Um, I, there are certain things that you learn in life that once you learn them, you like you practice them forever, right? It's a part of who you are. Can you talk about um, how this has most positively transformed your life personally and some habits that like you can't go back to anymore or, yeah. or, or new habits that you have, right? That, that um, you'll continue for the rest of your life. Yeah, no question. Well, the first one is I got fat and I'm talking super fat coaching so much so that like after practices, my knees, you know, were just killing me, my hips. You know, if I was demonstrating a defensive drill, it was over, you know, I'm super sore and stuff. And then it, you don't get fat because you have a hamburger. You get fat because you have habits over a course of time. Mm. So my habits consisted of every single day putting garbage in, you know, drinking, eating burgers, no sleep, no rest. I mean, it's a recipe for a disaster and it's a recipe to not be an elite performer. So when I go and I work with uh, companies and I work with athletic departments, the number one thing I talk about and I ask everyone in the room and I'll ask you all the same thing. Do you want to be an elite performer? Do you want to be an elite performer? And no one says, nah, I, I, I think I'd rather be average. Everyone wants to be elite. But the difference is most people aren't willing to do the things that it takes to be elite. And the things that I needed to do to be elite was I needed to do a better job of managing high expectations of myself. No one's putting those expectations on me but myself. And also understanding how to, how to best manage high stress situations, high anxiety situations. And so by me being able to do those things, when I didn't do those things well, I was an unhappy person. And see, there's one brain, you know, we want to think that, that there's the coach brain and the, the brain that you use when you're at home, but there's one y'all, there is one brain. And if that brain is filled with fear, then that brain's going to be fear, filled with fear all the time. And so I wasn't fun to be around for my family. I wasn't fun to be around for my team. And generally I wasn't fun to be in with myself. And so, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily think I'm like a comedian by any stretch, but I'm pretty fun and I enjoy doing a lot of different things. And so I've given myself permission to have fun doing something that I love to do. I mean, guys, we put our hair in ponytails and put on sweatsuits and wear tennis shoes every day. That's pretty much fun. So we need to allow ourselves to have a good time. That doesn't mean you don't work hard and you're not disciplined, but it, it means that you need to give yourself permission to enjoy what you're doing. So for me and Trey, the, the main thing that I had to do on my journey was figure out a way to release fear. And the best way that I have learned to do that is the ability to put fear in categories. So I put fear in three categories. Is this a fear that I put on myself that I created? Is it a fear that someone else put on me? That would be like someone having a gun. Is that a fear someone put on me? Or is that a fear that the situation caused? And once I put it into those three categories, I can better manage what's occurring. And then I can just go ahead and tell you, the opposite of fear is happiness. Isn't that crazy? And so when you take fear out of, out of the equation, like I am not afraid to lose a basketball game, you can then start having fun, enjoyment, and happiness while coaching a basketball game. Next question, Mike Pett. Coach, uh, it's been a while, but I, I just wanted to, I'd be remiss if I didn't say this. I actually met you in Las Vegas at the California Pizza Kitchen in Treasure Island with my college coach, Dean Lockwood. Yes, uh, nice to see you again, yes. Nice to see you. Um, 
I, the question I have, I, I love all of this stuff. I think a lot of, you know, uh, this is so important and valuable. My, my question would be, how do you specifically, or how have you specifically measured or quantified it in terms of, you know, again, like, like a lot of kids or players and stuff, and even us coaches, what are the results? You know, at some point we need to see, you know, all that work that they do and stuff produce, what's the production? And that would be the one question that I would ask, or I'd be curious about. Okay. So I had an experiment going on at the junior college and it was part of the, part of the reason I went to the junior college, because I said, okay, I'm going to do this for five years and I'm going to put all this data together. And so I tracked it during the course of the year. Um, and it's, it was more importantly based upon really, it was a behavioral deal. You know, how many times were, were they suspended or how many times, you know, did, did that something happen academically, something happen at home, et cetera. Uh, however, COVID hit. And so <laughs> that, that limited what we did at the end of that season. And then as a matter of fact, I trained the kids two times and I took the job up here um, and, it's been a little bit different of a process doing it here. What I will tell you is this, the little bit of research I have, which is not substantiated because we didn't have enough time to go through it. I will tell you that I, the, the final piece was tracking them when they went to their four-year school. So we sent four of those kids from the junior college into four-year situations. And how did they adapt? How did they manage? How did they take these things and continue to progress with them into their four-year schools. That has been cool. And this is the connection piece that I'm telling you this stuff creates. Those kids who I coached at the junior college who went on to four-year situations, the amount of times that they were in touch with me, the amount of times that they said, okay, coach, hey, listen, I started my green playlist and then this happened. And they were, they were wanting me to coach them more on, because now they're at a higher level doing it. And they're feeling a little more pressure and a little more stress and this COVID thing has their anxiety out the roof. And they were calling, asking for more information and more techniques around emotional intelligence. And so that, you know, I guess for me, you know, that is worth a million bucks. Uh, but the data did stop once I've gotten here. And, and it's going to be a little bit more difficult to track with what I'm doing. All right. Next question. John Wick. Uh, Coach, I want to say, you know, thank you for coming on tonight. Like, this is great. My question for you is, why has emotional intelligence became so important with successful leaders today? Because I see it everywhere now. Can you ask me one more time, John? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, no worries. Um, why has emotional intelligence became so important with successful leaders today? You know... <laughs> And I don't mean to oversimplify, but I would just tell you that most of the time leaders are in high performing job scenarios and the best ones and the leaders who are beloved are the leaders that treat people really, really good. And typically, if you are aware of your emotions and prepare to manage those, then you, the way that you speak with another person, it has them leaving the room feeling like that worth a million bucks. And so I think that makes a huge difference, but I also think it, it allows the leaders to, to better manage stress that thus better manages their life at home. Um, thus the yielding that occurs to where I think you've got to have a full circle of your life to be really, really good at anything. And generally speaking, I think, um, you know, EQ, unlike IQ is, it, it is also learned. But some people, just like you have a high IQ, naturally have a high EQ. So maybe that is worth clarifying as we're talking about this. Mm -hmm. The difference with EQ and IQ is EQ, you can increase it somewhere between 7 and 10%. So whatever you were given, and God sprinkled a little or a lot on you, you can elevate that thing 7 to 10% with some of this training. Thank you, Coach. Yes. All right, are there any more questions? Yeah, I'd like to ask one. Absolutely. Yeah. Rick, introduce yourself, please. Okay, Rick Vosk is high school coach out here in California, former uh, Trojan, as you, can, as you can see. 
<laughs> and um, I just want to say to Coach Macy, um, you are, uh, you know, sort of self-deprecating a little bit. You're trying to, uh, but hey, I'm telling you, Coach, you, you're the best dressed person on this damn, uh, I'm telling you. So with all the other things you're doing well, you got the, the look as well. So uh, congratulations on that. My question is, it's gonna be a little bit off topic, but you mentioned the bad job. And I'm just gonna be honest, you know, matter of fact is that's probably the one I'm gonna have to take. Would you take that job? Yeah, all day, every day. Okay. I've taken many of them. <laughs> Very good. And again, um, Coach, I, I, I really hope you don't mind, but I'm going to get a hold of you because this is good stuff. I'm a, a, a teacher at a correctional facility, you know, um, prisoners, if you will. And we have this in the opposite. It's a integrated substance uh, use disorder treatment. And you know, you were talking about dopamine and, and, and those things. And so it's very interesting. And, and uh, you know, CDCR, where I work, they are really trying to, to get a hold on this because it's the negative. They're, you're talking about the, the positive, happy, and things like that. So I really hope that uh, you don't mind that I will be bugging you. Uh, and I appreciate everything that uh, you, you've said thus far. And, and again, um, you, you got it going on, Coach. I, you know, you, you're good. I can just tell from right here. I appreciate that. And, Coach Sutton, if you don't mind, um, I can share my contact info or you can pass that on to everybody. That'd be great. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah Heather, I, I will pass that along to, to everyone, okay? I want to just make sure okay. we're always respect, uh, respectful of you, uh, the speaker, okay? So I'll, I'll pass that along accordingly, okay? Um, Thank you as well. Uh, absolutely. Um, Heather, um, can you share with us any closing remarks that, that can help us? Well, you've already helped us tremendously, but if you can share any closing remarks, uh, we'd greatly appreciate it before I bring it all to a close. Yeah, absolutely. I have it written on my board. I'm not sure how much you guys can see, but the one thing that, that I have, and it's a question that I ask myself every single day before I leave the office, is, is what did you fail at today? And I read that somewhere that, a really successful business owner growing up, her dad asked her every day at the dinner table, instead of, hey, did you have a good day? What happened? He asked her, what did you fail at today? And failure became something they could talk about. And if you didn't do something huge, then, then you, you, you're not going to fail. You're not risking anything. So you've got you've to set your goals and you've got to set your sights on something really, really big. And then don't be afraid to fail at it. So every single day I'm here, I want to make sure that I do something big enough that the opportunity to fail is there. And then the second question I ask myself as a reminder is it says, uh, yesterday's meal doesn't satisfy tomorrow's hunger. And so every single day when you wake up, coach, that, that win doesn't help you with that next win. And so let's make sure that we're building and we're growing these young people and building, growing these programs that we're responsible for and that we always, every single day, leave it better than we found it. And Kevin, thank you so much for this opportunity. Oh, absolutely. Um, Heather, thank you for, for coming on a Living Trophy Master Zoom class tonight. Um, you took your ladle um, and you poured into our buckets and you filled it up. Uh, my tribe is a very intentional about our development as people, you know, and as professionals. You made us better tonight, so I wanna say thank you for that. Um, this was a fantastic presentation. You were authentic. You said you were going to, uh, you weren't going to disappoint and you didn't disappoint. So we want to say thank you so much for, for coming on tonight as a speaker. You will always be invited uh, back, you know, and just to come back and share, you know, your time and uh, uh, on our Living Trophy Master Zoom class, you know. So in our parting words tonight, um, when you are pursuing greatness, you don't know your limits. And as a result, you must surround yourself with people who can make you grow stretch, and even if it means losing some of your friends that add to your value and help you, and help you to continue to grow. So in three words, I'm going to tell you, educate yourself, lead others, and make a difference in the world. Thank you so much for coming uh, to the Living Trophies Master Zoom class tonight. Tremendous performance uh, uh, by Heather Macy. We really appreciate everything that you did for us and making us better. 
continue to go out there and be the ladle that pours into the, the, the people that you serve and continue to create living trophies. So thanks so much for coming on, everybody, and look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you again, Heather. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Appreciate you, Coach. Jay Wick, good to see you, boy. Okay, son, happy to see your face, man. Oh, absolutely, JJ. You know that. <laughs> you know that. God is good all the time. Who you got right? coming next week, man? Who you got coming next week? You know what? I think. Let me see. I got to check my list here. In a couple of weeks, we're gonna have we're gonna have Coach Foy on here, the Queen. You know, she's, she's, she's gonna bring the thunder. Her and Bill Phillips, the power of words, the power of words. That's what we got. That's what we got, right? Next week. Next week, the power, the power of words. words. The power of words. Yes, sir. I, they're right here, right here. Everybody's blessed. JJ, you good? Good, man. I'm good. Good I'm to see good. you, boy. Fantastic. Nice to see you, bro. Yes, yes sir. sir. Absolutely. Keep doing your deal. Got you, man. Keep serving, brother. Keep serving. Coach Sutton? Yes, sir. Hey, um, where is Coach Macy at so I can look She's at um uh, Greensboro College in Greensboro, North Carolina. Greensboro College. Mm hmm Thank you, Coach. I, I appreciate it very much. Absolutely, brother. Absolutely. Come again. Uh-huh. Hey, uh, yeah, I'm unmuted. <laughs> Sometimes I forget to. Uh, have you seen the, have you been on